to be here for our second panel. As much as we did before each of the speakers, and in one case a group, will have 15 minutes for a talk, so I will try to keep the time, and then there will be extra time for our questions at the end. Thank you. And I will immediately give the floor to our first speaker, uh, Josh Van Diver uh, from University of Colorado. Josh, the floor is yours. I'm Josh Van Diver. I'm coming from University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. This will be a different kind of presentation, much more qualitative. I'm a political theorist and a gender studies scholar, and especially work in this new branch of gender studies, masculinity studies. And I really appreciate the call with respect to grassroots, because I worked on both left and right wing extremism and radicalism with this grassroots idea in mind, especially drawing from Deleuze and his notion of rhizomes, subterranean, networked, highly resilient structures. So I'm interested in that aspect of uh, extremist organizations. And then I'm also interested in this gendered aspect. There's that populism word again. Theorists are very slow, so I'm just finally getting around to reading my beloved mentor, <laughs> teacher, and friend, Jan Werner Mueller's book, What is Populism?, which will come up briefly here. The title of the talk is Andropopulism, which is somewhat different than the title. So I have a friend that thinks that academic slides should have a minimal amount of text, so this is the only one that will have any text on it. But this is from Jan Werner Mueller's book, What is Populism, 2016. I've just been thinking a little bit as I've studied these online influencers in the masculinist right, to what degree they are populist or identitarian or nationalists. Certainly they are very discontented. So Mueller's thinking about populism, which is fairly unique to him, uh, spurred some of my considerations for this conference. He argues that it is necessary but not sufficient to be critical of elites in order to qualify as a populist. That true populists claim that they, and only they, represent the people. And then finally, populism is always a form of identity politics, uh, but not all identity politics are populist, for Mueller. So with that as a framework, we're going to jump really quickly to this side of the Atlantic uh, and a populist on this side of the Atlantic named Tucker Carlson, who did a show, a documentary in 2022 on Fox News before he uh, left Fox News or was kicked out of Fox News, called The End of Men. So I use this as an instance of an American picking up a European figure, who we're going to meet in a minute, called Raw Egg Nationalist. This documentary featured this figure raw egg nationalist fairly prominently. And so this is a UK person, not this particular person, who um, is uh, tanning his testicles with red light. A belief amongst uh, the followers of raw egg nationalist and some of these other masculinists, uh, a belief that this is beneficial somehow to one's endocrine system, testosterone production, etc. So this raw egg nationalist and his followers, like this person, are featured in, in Carlson's documentary, which was watched by presumably millions of people. Uh, but my interest in the paper, and in this talk in particular, is with a magazine that Rogue Nationalist, this UK citizen, as far as we can tell, produces. Uh, his accent when he um, is on podcasts, he hasn't shown his face. A student of mine from Britain told me he's from Surrey. <laughs> the accent is clearly from Surrey. So maybe that's true, maybe not, but this UK citizen produces this magazine, which is initially online only, starting in 2020. And this is an example of these sort of technological networks that we're seeing that are so diffuse, so rhizomatic uh, across the so-called manosphere, as well as many other elements of, of online movements. The manosphere being a space online in which men and masculinities are <coughs> foregrounded, made the subject of discourse and disputation, 
Well, that's broadly the manosphere where this is all fitting into. This magazine is part of, again, this broad network, this loosely affiliated set of masculinists, masculinists or what I call andropopulists, and it features many of their work over the last few years, uh, including this other synonymous figure, the so-called Bronze Age pervert. <laughs> so he'll feature here as well. So this was the initial issue back in 2020, uh, Globo Uomo, the new handsome nationalist, as you can see on the left. You can see some of the figures that they feature. Mishima, Junger, they have some fascist figures in this magazine. But also it's just packed full of all these memes, these sort of insider products of the manosphere of these online discourses. Trying to unpack them is a major headache because they are so insular. And these magazines are accompanied by podcasts and you know, social media feeds and YouTube streams. So for a political theorist like me who just like to read Plato's Republic over and over and over again, this is a challenging uh, research project. Right Nationalist has a book called Right Nationalism, which I call a kind of gastronomic resistance to the Great Reset, that if you just eat lots of eggs, you will boost your testosterone, you will bump up your endocrine system. This is the argument here of this book. So gastronomic resistance to the Great Reset. Now we'll get a little bit of American context real quickly, just two slides here. You know, Richard Spencer, the founder of the alt-right, so this right-wing populist group in the American context, you know, after Charlottesville started this whole new kind of meta-political project called the Apollonian Transmission with this pseudonymous guy, Mark Brahman. And this is also very masculinist. It's making arguments about how men should behave, what sort of ideals they should look up to. But within this mythographic context, it's really neo-pagan. Several of the figures I look at are neo-pagan, which is quite interesting. There's a lot of talk now about Christian nationalism on this side of the Atlantic, but these are neo-pagans. So this is what the alt-right has been up to, this kind of project. And I think of it as part of this broader manosphere turn uh, towards neo-paganism and towards this physical culture. Here's another American, Jack Donovan, who has this mythographic project called Solar Idealism. Here he's out in Utah. These people cite each other, they disagree with each other, so they're not one sort of movement, but they are sort of in the same corner of the manosphere. This is a Swede, Marcus Bullen, the, AKA the Golden One, who puts himself out on his YouTube channel, lifting weights, flexing, calling his followers Laddingtons. It, it is all in English. So there's this kind of transatlantic network here. This is the golden one. And then one other figure that maybe isn't so obviously fitting into this hyper-masculine right-wing bodybuilder culture that we've been seeing, Thomas Roussel, who runs a YouTube channel called Survive the Jive, which looks again at sort of neo-pagan roots of English culture, European culture, the bit that is in common across all these figures is a kind of Aryanism, Indo-Europeanism, where they're trying to see commonalities across several countries and cultures that can somehow be linked back to an Indo-European or so-called Aryanist root. And here's Roussel talking at the traditional Britain group um, in 2021, which on its website you know, affiliates traditional Britain with Christianity, and yet they're open to this neo-pagan who's trying to reconstruct Anglo-Saxon roots to England into their Christmas social. But this all brings us back to perhaps the nexus of the broader manosphere for these right-wing bodybuilders that we've been seeing. Uh, the Bronze Age pervert, who we now think is Costa Aldemario, who is a Romanian-born, I think Newton Mass-raised, uh, Yale PhD in political science, but who for a long period of time operated under this pseudonym, Broad Sage Pervert. So for a long time we just had this avatar of this person's back, and then he would appropriate images of other people, in this case Pietro Bosselli, an Italian supermodel, and post things about race, of right-wing political thought, Carl Schmidt, many other figures, Leo Strauss, appear in his feed. And then finally sort of coming out of the shadows just quite recently. The book that made him famous is Bronze Age Mindset, which is this kind of hyper-masculinist, 
vitalist Nietzschean appeal to resisting an effete and effeminate and decadent and corrupt Western civilization. So he's channeling many, many populist discontents about uh, health, like we saw earlier with Rag Nationalists, that somehow modern society is unhealthy, especially for men. He's channeling that, but then weaving it into all this right-wing thought. And that's what Bronze Age, per Bronze Age Pervert's book, Bronze Age Mindset, brings out. Here's his recent book, Under His Own Name, which was his Yale PhD, a reading of Plato and Nietzsche, entitled Selective Reading and the Birth of Philosophy. Some follower posts that with the supplement, interweaving these body culture, physical culture, milieu, and the philosophical one. Circling back to the magazine itself that I started with, this is the focus of my paper, trying to interrogate how what I call the meta-narrative of this particular group of andropopulists is constructed. And I draw the notion of meta-narrative from the strategic studies scholars who focus on strategic culture in particular. And they've studied, in certain cases, um, decentralized networks like Al-Qaeda and others that don't have any kind of central ideological clearinghouse, and yet still need to have a way of motivating and organizing a loosely non-organized group of figures in a network. Meta-narrative does that in this, in this scholarship on strategic culture by offering belonging, by offering a way of life, a way of living, and by characterizing the enemy in a certain way. And I think we see this in this online magazine, which is now turned into a print publication. <coughs> Perhaps they received from funding or a bump in readership after they were featured on Tucker Carlson. But I think we see this notion of belonging to begin there with this calling out to a certain audience, especially of young men, young white men, to identify with a certain geopolitical vision not the insular defense of rooted historical cultures like we see in identitarianism, but a defense of colonialism, settler colonialism. So the magazine, while being produced by UK National, really frames itself to a broader settler colonial community across the world, valorizing conquistadors, settlers of other types, conquerors, and saying, these are the true people in countries like the United States, other settler colonies. The true people, back to that Mueller definition, are the descendants of these settler colonists. That's the thrust of the magazine, and it's inviting a kind of belonging, identification, if people think of themselves as descended from those settler communities. The enemy is framed, as you can see here, from a panel of the first issue of the magazine, as a combination of sexual minorities, gender minorities, racial minorities, and also the element of health and food with the soy there in the mix of it. The soy is apparently very, very bad in their account. But that's some belonging, that's the enemy. Here's some evidence of what I was saying before about the colonial, the settler colonial appeal that these particular brands of transatlantic populists make with books about empire being advertised, a certain kind of colonial way of life, and then also the way of living that's fixated on this right-wing bodybuilding, that third element of meta-narrative in decentralized communities. Back to the sexual gender minorities, here's a set of panels which I actually don't read in terms of sexuality, but as gender. I make this point in an interview I do for the Agra magazine that these critiques aren't that soy makes you homosexual necessarily, or that the way of life that men live in the West now, closing deals on porta potties and then going to happy hour, don't make one homosexual, but just make one effete, effeminate, decadent, degenerate. So it's a gendered statement, not a one about sexuality, I argue. And then here's an opposition which occurred after the start of the war in Ukraine to the war. That's the final strand in the paper, which is there is a geopolitical message ultimately coming out of this milieu that in the case of Man's World Journal and Bronze Age Pervert is anti-Ukraine. 
pro-Russia. Most recently, they've taken a turn, though, to being pro-Israel and anti-Palestine. Last bits as I wrap up on how they frame the enemy. All of this has collapsed into the poor Venus of Willendorf, how she's ended up in this mix. <laughs> they center all the things they dislike on a concept called the longhouse, which is, a, again, a feminine culture, a neoliberal global order that prevents greatness, the type of expansionary geopolitics that they valorize, the settler colonialism that had been seen in earlier ages. They lump down into this, they boil down to this notion of a longhouse, this stultifying court culture that they're trying to break out of, maybe with the help of an Augustus, maybe with the help of some other handsome nationalists like this reimagined Putin. So a qualitative dive into some crazed corners of the manosphere. I'm calling them Andro populists. I'd like to try to think more about to what degree they really are populists, or to what degree they are ethnic nationalists or identitarians of the type that my friend Pedro Zucchetti is such an expert in, a world-renowned expert. We'll hear from him later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gunas, for this introduction, and thank you, organizers, for having us here. And this presentation nicely connects with the previous one on this manosphere, because collective rest demand is also a phenomenon that is mostly illustrated by these angry white men who want to be like these figures that you presented in your uh, presentation. Okay. In the background, you see a familiar picture from the insurrection of the Capitol Hill on January 6, 2021, a building out there. This attack against the heart of liberal democracy is one of the best known and dramatic manifestations of collective resentment. It also highlights the fact that whether resentment emerges from either individual or group-based grievances that are transmuted through the influence of discourses and narratives in politics, culture, and media, into other directed emotions of resentment, content, and, and hate, it always ends up taking collective forms that threaten liberal democracy. Even so, the collective dimensions of ressentiment have remained understudied in extant research <coughs> of this complex socio-psychological phenomenon. So we focus on them in this presentation. And here's an overview of what we're going to say. First about ressentiment, then elements of collectivity in ressentiment, and then case study collective ressentiment in Russia, and then finally, some concluding remarks. What is Rassentiment? Well, Rassentiment can be illustrated by Aesop's famous fable of a fox, who after repeated failures to reach the sweet grapes he covets, gives up and goes away saying, well, they are sour, I didn't want them anyway. This reappraisal of the properties and value of the grapes allows the fox to maintain his self-worth in the situation in spite of his failure to get the grapes. Ressentiment as a technical notion emerges from the work of philosophers Friedrich Nietzsche and Max Scheler, already in early 20th century. They understand it to be emerging from negative emotions such as inefficacious anger, envy and shame in recurrent situations where one feels impotent to act on or even express these emotions, which then leads to feelings of inferiority, impotence, and powerlessness. And through these, the repression of these emotions, they are being transformed into other emotions, namely passive resentment, hostility, and hatred. Resentment typically is related to social inequality and social comparison. Scheller already wrote, I quote, 
Present demand must be strongest in a society like ours, where approximately equal rights, political and otherwise, or formal social equality, publicly recognized, go hand in hand with wide factual differences in power, prosperity and education. This is an ob observation that holds true in contemporary world as much as or even more in Scheller's days, especially when neoliberal ideology of individual responsibility always blames the individual for being a loser in this situation where he finds himself a loser in a social comparison. So it is witnessed among the powerless and disadvantaged either by objective standards or subjective experience. And the function of resultant demand is to operate the transvaluation to manage this frustration and emotional pain emerging from these negative emotions about the self. What was desired and valued, yet unattainable, is reassessed as undesirable and rotten, and the self is reassessed from a position of social or moral inferiority to superiority. Also, it's been noted that present demand centered around victimhood. So these negative emotions that drive present demand involve this powerless self-reproaching victimhood, which is then transformed into morally superior victimhood to present demand. And this morally superior victimhood provides justification for other directed negative emotions, namely resentment, indignation, and hatred which then forms also a foundation for the formation of collective victimhood identity. And through this centrality of victimhood, present demand has been argued to be the contemporary political emotion, as it's been noted to be an effective driver of reactionism, both left and right, right-wing populism and radicalism, and religious fundamentalism, fanaticism and extremism. Finally, we suggest that present demand should be best understood as an emotional mechanism, not as an emotion as such, like anger, fear, etc., but as an emotional mechanism that explains transformations of certain emotions into other specific emotions by showing a process that leads to this transformation, their constituent elements, and their mutual relationship. And in a paper with Alessandro Salice, we have argued that there are three, uh, four conditions of emotional mechanisms. First, this kind of feeling of emotional dissonance, this sense of inferiority and impotence, which is elicited by this inability to even express or act on emotions in these situations where persons feel envy, shame, or identification anger. Then there is this reappraisal of target qualities or values or subjects. Like in the case of the fox, he evaluated the properties of the grapes as sour. Or in the case of values, you could re-evaluate the value of sweetness as bad and say that sourness is actually good. Or more realistic case, arguing that consumption is actually bad and frugality is good, even if you previously tried to be excessive in consumption. And if you are successful in these reappraisals, there emerges a change in emotional response. You can change the evaluation of the target, sometimes involving this change in your long-term concerns. And finally, this change needs to be reinforced and validated through collectivization. So these emotions that are the outcomes of resulting more and then, then shared with socially, socially with their others in social movements, political demonstrations, rallies, and so on. But now, Christian will take over and explain how we could uh, exploit this understanding of resident demand and the collective dimensions involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks Miko. Um, I'll now try to walk you uh, through this table uh, a little bit. Uh, so in, in some cases of ressentiment, the idea is that the identity and the values which are targeted and perceived as being under threat are individual and personal ones. And so the chronic failure to live up to these identities and values and the sense of inferiority and impotence that comes with them are typically attributed to the self and to one's own responsibility. So the driving emotions of ressentiment in this case will typically be individual level emotions such as envy, shame, humiliation, or inefficacious anger. Now we 
do assume that micro-level processes of transvaluation, the ones that Miku just mentioned, uh, of psychic defenses such as repression, splitting, or projection, uh, they play a major role in these individual forms of ressentiment. Of course, they are supported very likely by meso- and macro-level processes such as peer influence, group norms, or larger discourses and narratives of politics and culture. And so this situation of individual level ressentiment, it might describe a situation, uh, for example, uh, coming back to the example that Miko mentioned of Trump supporters, uh, in the longer term past, uh, probably years or decades long run up to what then happened on Capitol Hill in 2021. However, we hypothesize that what happened on Capitol Hill could not have happened without the involvement of the collective dimensions of ressentiment. And this would involve, crucially, the tendency of individuals to perceive the values and identities which are threatened and to which one cannot live up, not primarily as individual and personal ones, but rather as group-based ones. For example, as misrecognized white working class men whose shared values and convictions are perceived as being disrespected. Now, not being able to live up to these group-based values and identities gives rise, in our theoretical model, to group-based driver emotions of shame, humiliation, and anger. So it's no longer individual-level emotions that drive ressentiment, but it's these group-based emotions. And then the idea would be that it's not so much these individual micro-level processes of transvaluation that kick in, but it's more meso and macro level processes of transvaluation, such as cultural practices, discourses, and narratives. And they play a lead role, for example, in perceiving what others have or are as rotten and undesirable, and in enhancing one's own collective identities as being valor valorized and cherished. And so now here, it's all about being recognized as a group and not so much being recognized as an individual. And no matter what, the outcome emotions in this model, the outcome emotions of ressentiment are always collective or group-based ressentiment, indignation, contempt, hatred, but only in combination with the group-based identities, values, and the driver emotions that I just outlined, that's one of the main ideas, only in combination with that, they have the potential to conjure up uh, events like the ones that we witnessed on Capitol Hill in 2021. So the idea is this cannot be explained by making reference to individual level uh, emotions and individual dimensions of ressentiment alone, but in order to be able to explain that using ressentiment, we need to account for this collective I will now hand over to Gunas, uh, who will present uh, the Russian example as a case in hand. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I will focus on Russia, but just to bring back um, sort of the importance of what we're trying to do is that we're trying to uh, both acknowledge that... Yes. Like that? Better? Yeah. We're trying to both acknowledge and build on the research on, on political psychology research that has been done on ressentiment on an individual level in terms of acknowledging and understanding what's happening in an individual psyche as the process of ressentiment or the phenomenon of ressentiment takes place and that is being used politically and to cause all these phenomena that we're discussing today, but also bring in the group and collective aspect of it because the political entrepreneurs who rely on individual level emotions, right, are key actors in, um, in, in the process that we're talking about. And they latch on to individual level emotions, but make them, shift them in a way they, they don't collectivize them, but they shift them into the group, group level. And we are in the middle of this, you know, media observations of growing Islamophobia and growing anti-Semitism around the world. And this is exactly what's happening when individuals all of a sudden wake up and, and, and start blaming the Jews or start blaming the Arabs or, you know, we are sort of in the midst of it. And I think unpacking the mechanisms that happen and also irresponsible parties is an important um, 
um, uh, contribution to uh, you know to, to bringing together the both the individual level and the collective level and Russia uh, is uh, a great example of how the feelings of ressentiment on the individual level uh, have been uh, socialized collectivized and made into the center of um, of, of the war and the tragedy and the transformation that we are um, uh, observing uh, today, currently, and over the past years as well. So, with uh, the case of Russia, we start from uh, you know the, that there has been one uh, collective identity shattering event, and that's the collapse of the Soviet Union. Despite that being on the background, um, it's not something that determines certain outcomes because it depends on how it would be then reinterpreted. And early on. The transformation of the Soviet Union into New Russia was uh, was something that was desired by the population. Was something that was um, seen as a progress, as society has chosen its leaders and that have moved and transformed from communism to markets to West as a model to valuing democracy, pluralism, uh, open politics, and um, so. Despite the, the, you know, early on that collapse of the Soviet Union for from the popular perspective has not been such a trauma as it became in 2000s. Uh, however, what is important then for starting out this emotional process of ressentiment is, or the mechanism, uh, in the, the, the life experiences <clears throat> that people had in the 1990s as the market reforms unfolded and causing social, economic dislocation, deprivation, um, status changed, uh, anxieties, uh, inequality, perceptions of injustice. That created the early conditions that then Miko mentioned as conditions for the unfolding of emotional uh, mechanism of dissentiment. And um, from already in the 90s, but in 2000s at a very uh, politically salient level, uh, these emotions were, in a way, turned uh, to make the group perspective very relevant. Uh, from at least 2012-2013, we'd see a very strategically employed uh, narratives of, um, you know, taking Russia on the path of trans this process of transvaluation that is an important step that happens in the emotional process of ressentiment as these pro-Western, pro-market, pro-democracy values have been turned precisely the opposite into anti-Westernism, anti-Americanism, anti-market, anti-democracy towards the value of stability and order and then towards the value of Russian civilization as a standalone millennial Russia um, as and, and then into the perspective of moral superiority vis-à-vis -vis the West. So from, as Russia started out its path to become like a West, you know, remember that fox right, that didn't quite reach those grapes, it then turned its back to the West and suggested that, you know, the West is actually a morally uh, degrading and incapable. And so um, the whole of Putin's uh, rhetoric and, and um, collective victim and, and um, strategy has been built on this reappraisal and transvaluation that played into the psychology at the individual level because people who have been feeling insecure, inferior, uh, frustrated and, and resentful all of a sudden got help, psychological help through these transvaluation and reappraisal processes. Yes, I think the second one actually just, just repeats them, uh, what I have already uh, suggested. So let me just move um, to the last concluding remarks of, uh, of the work ahead that, um, uh, that we see this, this is a paper and work in progress. Um, I think the uh, more elaborate theory of collective ressentiment that will build on the early work, uh, classical work, Nietzsche and will integrate the individual level perspectives is something that's um, our main uh, um, ambition and um, the, so some of the uh, key questions that are standing out are um, you know how uh, you know under which conditions in what situations the uh, emotions that people start with the self-targeting negative uh, emotions move shift to the group-based perspective uh, and um, how the 
uh, individual psychic defenses get externalized and offloaded to public narratives and discourses. And most importantly, what are the mediating actors and you know, in media, in culture, in politics that, that create and circulate and broadcast such uh, discourses and narratives that reinforce and foster the transvaluation and reappraisal processes in uh, different um, uh, societal contexts. Thank you. Right. Uh, in my presentation, I will present the relationship between uh, increasing income inequality and declining democratic support. Um, seems like I'm adding little quantitative flavor to the list of presenters. Uh, I hope it's not too boring. Um, so, motivation for study is uh, kind of rising literature over the last few decades uh, on the negative relationship between income inequality and the popular support for democracy, which I shall call democratic support following the scholars of, in this field. Um, so there's growing consistent evidence uh, on the negative impact of increasing income inequality on popular support for democracy in general, uh, both case studies and cross-national studies. And especially, uh, as you all know, the recent explosion of literature on right-wing populism uh, consistently suggested that uh, you know people tend to turn to authoritarian leaders and kind of get disappointed with um, democratic governance upon observing uh, increasing, ever increasing income inequality, kind of recognizing that as a failure of democratic governance, uh, you know, feeling anger. Uh, deprivation and resentment um, toward uh, those at the top of income ladder and political elites in general who kind of cause this failure. Uh, but uh, I found there is still a lot of things we need to know to correctly understand the relationship between income inequality and democratic support. And I found two puzzles uh, in the existing literature. Uh, one puzzle is that it's still unclear uh, whether or to what extent uh, income inequality causes or is correlated with uh, declining democratic support because, I mean, it's sensible to say income inequality has some negative impact on people's perception of dem uh, democracy or satisfaction with democracy, but at the same time, think about this. Over the last few decades, you know, for example, after World War II, there were a lot of ups and downs in income inequality, right? Think about at the time of huge economic recession or downturn, right? But have we ever seen dramatic collapse of democracy? <coughs> or have we ever seen kind of dramatic decrease in people, people's evaluation of democratic governance or their democratic governance? Maybe not. But at the same time, it sounds impossible to say inequality has no impact on people's attitude toward democracy, right? And I found one plausible explanation from the established uh, political scientist Ron Engelhardt impressionistic observation that uh, people's normative support for democracy moves differently from their, uh, their inclination toward an authoritarian leader, meaning that people can turn to authoritarianism or authoritarian leader while cheering for uh, democracy or while cheering even more for democracy. 
uh, but this assumption has not been rigorously tested. Uh, the second puzzle I found in the ex existing literature uh, is lack of consideration uh, of differences in democratic regimes. Assume income inequality has some negative impact on democratic support, right? But can we also think that you know this impact is uniform across different regimes of democracy? Some democracies are more mature and more established, right? And some others are weaker, younger, and less, and less established, right? So there might be differences uh, in the effect of increasing income inequality on people's evaluation of democracy. And here I brought two different regimes of democracy. One is uh, often, often called electoral democracy, which means in countries in which we see just competitive multi-party elections regularly held. And the other is liberal democracy, as you all know, democracies in which we saw in addition to uh, fair elections, kind of conventional measures for minority protection, checks and balances and all conventional measures for uh, 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 protecting uh, minority and equality before the law. And uh, we can um, implicitly draw some opposite hypotheses from the existing literature on democratic learning and democratic socialization. One is that it, in electoral democracy, uh, where uh, income inequality has dramatic negative impact on people's support for democracy because in electoral democracy, which is less mature, less established one compared to liberal democracy, people's learning about uh, learning of democratic values and virtues are quite limited because other than election, they have an experiences. Uh, they don't have any kind of deep experiences with learning. Uh, virtues and values of democracy, for example, minority protection and, and, and all the other stuff. Uh, but at the same time, we can also figure out the opposite hypothesis from the literature on democratic learning because we can also assume you know, people with greater experiences of democratic regime might have higher expectation on their government, right? Because they experience, they kind of enjoy a lot more from democratic regime and institutions, right? So increasing inequality might be perceived as dramatic failure of democratic governance in the, in the area of the economy, right? So I tested uh, these two hypotheses, two groups of hypotheses, mm -hmm. using data from World Value Survey and uh, various sets of macro macroeconomic indicators. Uh, for democratic support, uh, for two measures of democracy, uh, I draw kind of conventional measures uh, uh, from World Value Survey. One measures normative support for democracy, and the other measures people's inclination for the authoritarian leader. Uh, for uh, inequality measures, I used uh, the ratio of top 10% income share to top bottom 40% income share and the, the, the ratio of top 10% to uh, bottom 10% income share following the literature on income inequality and democratic governance and the recent literature on right-wing populism. Uh, I didn't use Gini coefficient following some critique of it, uh, saying that it doesn't really reflect the income disparity, but I also tested uh, we ran all the models using Gini coefficient and found pretty much a consistent finding. And I drew uh, VLM data uh, for measures of electoral democracy and liberal democracy and control for all the conventional measures from the existing literature. I'm more than happy to discuss more about the methodological things in the Q&A if you like. Um, so here's the aggregate level uh, plot, uh, which does represent the observation for con each country for each given year in my sample. So here, the x-axis represents each measure for income inequality, and here on the top, the y-axis represents for normative support for democracy. And here at the bottom, the y-axis represents uh, people's inclination toward an authoritarian leader. And here, the black solid lines the fit the association 
among entire observations. And here, the red one fits the observation, uh, sorry, the association between the two variables within a liberal democracy, the purple uh, fits the association uh, within electoral democracy. As you can imagine, uh, the, the overall association fit the conventional expectation, right? The greater uh, inequality, uh, lower support for democracy. The greater inequality, uh, greater inclination towards authoritarian leader, right? But there are differences across the regimes. Interestingly, here, uh, uh, remember the red fits the association within uh, liberal democracy. And as you can see, the association is more negative in liberal democracy, right, between inequality and normative support. And here, one more interesting thing is, in electoral democracy, you see the negative, slightly negative association between income inequality and authoritarian inclination, meaning then, upon observing increasing inequality, citizens in electoral democracy became less inclined towards the authoritarian leader. But in liberal democracy, you see greater inequality, greater inclination towards an authoritarian leader. So people punish in liberal democracy. Uh, so here's my model, the three-level hierarchical logic regression. I'm more than happy to discuss more about methodological things in the Q&A if you like, uh, to save my time in presentation. Um, so I found no models, uh, no outcome for the relationship between inequality and normative support for democracy, uh, potentially implying that people can still support normatively support democracy even under increasing inequality. Uh, statistically, I couldn't find a significant relationship between inequality, country level inequality, and individual level support for democracy. Uh, so here is the finding for the relationship between inequality and authoritarian inclination. As you can see, uh, the relationship, uh, the interact, interaction coefficient uh, is significant for this, and more kind of, you know, more intuitive interpretation you see. Here again, sorry, the, the purple, the, the fit prediction for liberal democracy, the blue fit prediction for electoral democracy, and this model show, outcome shows, the greater inequality, greater inclination toward authoritarian leader in liberal democracy as you saw in the aggregate level plot. Um, so here's my key findings. And again, more than happy to talk about methodological things in the Q&A. Um, so my major contribution from this piece is that uh, we kind of don't see the naive relationship between income inequality and democratic support. But relationship is pretty much more nuanced. Uh, suggesting that inequality doesn't really kind of depress people's normative support of democracy, but it can raise people's inclination toward an authoritarian leader in more mature democracy, which also sheds some new light on the theory of democratic learning and democratic socialization. And last but not least, it can, uh, it kind of provides some concrete explanation for why we saw the rise of authoritarian leaders and authoritarian parties in countries where we believe a liberal democracy most flourishing. Thank you very much. And I would like to invite our fourth speaker, Giuseppe Dosukitis. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. It's actually my first time in DC, like the uh, same with, uh, with Alice. I came, but my luggage didn't. So I don't know what God is trying to tell me. Um, so when, when someone asked me what, what was the first thing you did in DC, the Capitol, the White House. No, I went to Walmart and bought clothes. So, um, so when I was told about the subjects for this conference, I was like, wow. I mean, my topic is just just fills all the, all, the, all, the, all the checks. Because this theme, the opposition to the Great Reset, it's almost like a field of study by itself. Um, 
I only have 15 minutes, so here I'll, I'll just focus on dominant narratives, and I will show a few images uh, and memes. So what is this Great Reset? As you probably all know, the Great Reset has been promoted and, um, and branded by the World Economic Forum and by its founder, the German Klaus Schwab, uh, who is viewed by critics as some sort of James Bond villain. Uh, so the Great Reset is advocated as a new beginning for economy and for the humanity. The narrative initially advanced by Great Reset promoters was about taking advantage of the global pandemic. Uh, the idea that the global health crisis opened an opportunity to reset, or to put it in terms that have been used by activists and politicians to build a new uh, post-COVID world to build back better. For Great Reset opponents, this is a sinister and evil plan. Um, According to them, behind the nice sounding slogans, a sinister force is at play. The plan is essentially to make the world, not just economically, but also socio-politically, and even biotechnologically, and put it under control of a global technocratic and authoritarian elite, creating in this way a new world order. And here it's important to keep in mind that the, the opposition to the Great Reset is the latest version of a longer history of anti-globalism. It is the latest episode of a series. And in, the narrative, in this narrative, the greatest set is almost like a rebranding of a New World Order agenda. We've only just begun. For music connoisseurs here, that was a, a song from the, the Carpenters yeah. in the 1980s. It's also our, our Great Reset opponents see the implementation of the Great Reset. They've only just begun. The response to COVID with lockdown, vaccine, vaccine mandates, and digital certificates was just a test run, a tryout, to implement other radical politics of population control. According to this, the Great Reset will advance from global crisis to global crisis. The pandemic, the climate change, global food crisis, any other crisis, they will be exploited by elites to advance their agenda of domination. And there are many references to the concept of disaster capitalism and to Naomi Klein's shock doctrine and how elites capitalize on chaos. Repeatedly, these critics warn that contrary to advertise, the goal of the great resetters is not the benefit of humanity a new happy step into the future, but instead a new post-democratic regime that separates even more the elites from the people. And the opponents use different analogies to describe this coming caste system. Uh, for example, there are those who talk about a neo-medieval, neo-feudal era, the lords versus the peasants. But regardless, there's always this idea that what is in the works is a rigid division between an overclass and an underclass. The overclass is comprised of two elements. Fabulous wealthy people, the tech oligarchs, the philanthropists, the Bill Gates and Soros of the world, and the clerisy, those who administrate society, the technocrats, including academics. And this superclass, rules over an underclass, the rest, the majority of the people. And in this narrative, technology is viewed as nothing but a tool used by elites to control the masses in a way never seen before. That is why the combat against technological reset is dominant in these circles, against the fourth industrial revolution meaning the Internet of Bodies, or um, where Internet-connected devices monitor the human body and collect personal biometric data. And against this new era of the fusion of biology and technology, these are seen as tools of mass, for mass surveillance and totalitarian control. But there is more. Science fiction will no longer be fiction. Looking into the future, for many of these critics, this technological development 
will lead to transhumanism and the further reinforcement of the caste system with a society increasingly divided between the enhanced, those elites who have access to, to artificial intelligence technologies, and the masses of the unenhanced. This could also be the beginning of a great movie, by the way. <laughs> it, it's important to keep in mind that there are many lines of attack against the Great Reset. One of them is specifically religious. And this connected with the idea that that they see it as the post-human end goal of the Great Reset. Some groups, especially associated with traditional Catholicism, for example, the group Civitas in France, or uh, around the magazine Compact in Germany, they see the Great Reset as an open door for the kingdom of evil. As a diabolical plan, the coming of the Antichrist prophesied by the Bible. There are actually diabolical interpretations that make connections with the number of the beast from the book of Revelation and the logo of the World Economic Forum. As you see, a blue semicircle goes through the O and turns into a six, three times. <laughs> um, so, in the Antichrist Great Reset camp, the main frame of analysis is one of freedom against tyranny. There is an ongoing dialectic of enslavement and liberation. Many such examples, I'll just give two. The global food supply that uh, Josh mentioned here. In 2016, the World Economic Forum announced its predictions for 2030. One of them was how people will m must eat less meat for the good of the environment and our health. anti great reset opponents see this prediction as yet more evidence of a conspiracy hidden in plain sight to control people's behaviors and ways of life. This perceived push to ban meat is viewed as just a preparation for a plant-based future built on new alternative proteins, including bugs, controlled by corporations in collusion with governments. You eat bugs and you'll be happy. That's the meme. Also, the idea of the Great Replacement that is often viewed as a crucial building block of the Great Reset. It is explained in terms of domination and freedom from domination. How? Because according to this narrative, the Great Replacement, by eliminating differences between peoples through mass immigration, multiculturalism, eroding the ethnic and cultural identities of peoples, by treating all peoples as a global mass, undifferentiated, ruthless, by doing this, people are then more easily controlled and manipulated by what many call the global overlords. Other examples include the rejection of 15-minute cities or, or the move to a cashless society, where central banks gain total control over economic transactions, limiting the privacy and freedom of individuals. And finally, all of these developments in the self-perception of activists have led to the Great Revolt. Basically what it means is that local national protests against governments are viewed within a larger anti-Great Reset storyline. These protests, protests are not disconnected, they are pieces of a puzzle. Examples include demonstrations against pandemic rules, Canada's trucker protests, Netherlands' farmer protests that have expanded to other European countries against government climate plans to cut livestock and reduce farming, and even mass protests in places like Sri Lanka against food, electricity, and, um, and electricity shortage, or against rising inflation in Europe. So these are proclaimed as freedom fights against global tyranny, as well as symptoms of the Great Revolt. So what is the takeaway? Um, in my view, there are two key points. First, what we see unfolding here is that in the discourse against the Great Reset, that is the twist. Liberalism comes to the rescue. Meaning, in terms of discourse, it is not a straight-out anti-liberal movement. There are many gray zones where the language of liberalism and democracy is used as a sort of shield against what is perceived to be an authoritarian assault on peoples. I'll just flesh out a few points about this dynamic. The connection with anti-absolutism, one of the main principles of liberalism, the idea that a global plan or, plan or world government clashes with the liberal principle 
of a constitutional limited government focused on advancing the rights of individuals to life, liberty, and property. And two, clashes with the idea that power is and must be limited, not unlimited. It must be bounded, not boundless. The connection with the freedom of individual, a, a basic tenet of liberalism. The idea that the world pushed forward by the great resetters means the end of individual freedom. A world where individuals are monitored and controlled by corporations and governments. The connection with the classical liberal right for privacy. The idea that in the new world order, being accelerated by global elites, personal data will be technologically controlled by superior powers, such as corporations and governments. The control will then lead to the erasure of the border between public and private, a sign of totalitarianism. These uses of the language of liberalism must be part of analysis of current anti-globalist groups and movements. At least in some dissident narratives, it is more complicated than just liberals versus illiberals. And keep in mind that they can use the language of liberalism while at the same time remaining opposed to different degrees, openly or not, remaining opposed to the institutions of liberal democracy parliaments, courts, judges, mainstream press, because they are viewed as tools of the machine of the system. Second, and finally, there should be attention to the increase of ideological convergences and strange bedfellows, where individuals and groups with different backgrounds may find common ground under the big tent of anti-government and anti-power, or sharing the same premise that the system needs to collapse. The fact is that many of these criticisms cut across the right-left divide. We see that in the wider anti-Great Reset camp. Many of these views are not an exclusive to the extreme right. For example, against authoritarian liberalism, or against invasive technology, or against biopolitical surveillance, these are very much present in some sections of the left and the extreme left. To conclude, first, the drivers of dissent are not necessarily drivers of illiberalism, though they may be, but they may also indicate a visceral protest against what is perceived as a betrayal of liberalism. And second, those who walk the path of dissidents are not exclusive to one extreme of the ideological spectrum. Thank you. to questions. Similar to the first panel, we'll have about 30 minutes uh, to collect the questions and give them to our speakers. Do we have the mics um, or are we just going to show them? Okay. Right. okay. Ms. Grant, please introduce yourself. Uh, hi all, thank you. Uh, my name is Grant. I work here at the Illiberalism Studies Program. Uh, my question is for Josh. Um, so if um, Nick Fuentes once said that the straightest thing you could be was a gay incel, so I wanted to ask about the sort of homoerotic subtext of a lot of the uh, publications and the memes that are created uh, for the expression of the kinds of things that you were talking about in your presentation. Hi, uh, I'm sorry. Hi, I am Pedro Guasti. I also have a question for Josh. I'm so, I was mesmerized by, I think we both like tend to find weird corners of <laughs> the internet. Like we can share, I have some complimentary views from anti-choice uh, women's angels programs. But my question to you is, while I love the presentation, I'm not sure what lifting is populism really doing for you in the view you have it and whether nativism misogyny uh, what do I have? racism imperialism are not not better for 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 you yeah thank you one more at the back Great, thanks. Uh, Julian Waller, uh, Center for Naval Analyses, and also a fellow here at George Washington. Um, so a question first for uh, Dr. Lee. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, 
did you, are you able to test, given the data set you have, not just sentiment, uh, uh, orientation towards democracy or authoritarianism, but actually uh, testing it temporally based on regime collapse or regime change in these countries? Because there's not a direct correlation between sentiment for an authoritarian leader or sentiment for democracy and actual autocratization or regime collapse or coup or something like that. The relationship is, it depends, it depends on how you measure it. Um, and there's a conceptual differentiation as well because regime change is almost always driven by elites um, and not by populations. So I'm just wondering if you have the data on that to, to, to look at that more directly. It, it gets to the question of what exactly is mattering here. Uh, and a question to uh, Dr. Van Diver. Um, I echo Petra's sentiments that I'm not sure if populism is the right way to look at it. These uh, guys, um, Rag Nationalist, Bronze Age Pervert, uh, and others very much so have this sort of elitist, uh, arist quasi aristocratic approach uh, in these online communities on Frog Twitter and so on. Um, so I'd just be interested in, in, in that. And also, for someone like uh, Rag Nationalist and Man's World Magazine, um, and also you should look at the Asylum as well, which is a, a liberal journal. Um, to what degree are they just mimicking other self-help trends that exist in sort of the, the mass publication world and just in a much more uh, trollish and intentionally provocative way? Uh, anyway, thank you. Thank you. Are there more questions? Then let's start uh, with this round. Um, yeah, I'll try to be really quick. Thank you for the questions. I don't know what Nick Fuentes has meant by saying that the straightest person or guy is a gay incel. You'll have to explain that to me later. But I mean, I study masculinity in a historical context. So among straight male communities in the West, there's a lot of homoerotic banter. That's just part of how they construct their discourse with one another. So I don't think that's very unusual. I do think that these claims about gender, sort of being gay in this effeminate or feet sense, these are gender claims. They're not claims about sexuality. So I'll just reiterate that point. And then in terms of populism, yeah, I totally agree that I don't think it's doing a ton of work with these people. But as I thought about the term in light of Mueller's definition, that populism entails claiming that you represent the true people, maybe that's an idiosyncratic definition within the larger literature of populism. But these people do seem to be, yes, elitist to the, to the third question. But in that sense, they're claiming to represent, as an elite, the true people. What's unusual in their neo-paganism is that they envision the true people, in the England's case, not being a Christian English people, but a pagan English people, if they were just to return to their earlier paganism. So in those senses, the representation of a true people, if that's an adequate or you know, an acceptable definition of populism, which it may not be, but going from that one, it does seem like there's room for this nativism, imperialism, nationalism, and misogyny in this group's elitist definition of itself as representing this true people. <clears throat> uh, thanks for the question. I uh, really like that. Um, so for that study, the, the structural data does not really allow uh, to test the relationship between country-level inequality and regime change because given the, the structure of world body surveys, I don't have any other changes, but um, what you're saying is being tested in my ongoing study in which I've been collecting data, country level income inequality data and democratic, you know, democratic regime data, support data, uh, and the, the quality of governance data for more than 60 countries over more than 60 years. So for pre from preliminary analysis, I found a significant relationship, causal relationship between inequality and regime, kind of democratic backsliding, kind of backward regime change. I, I mean, we couldn't really see a democratic collapse. I mean, among democracies, we barely saw transition from democracy to authoritarian regime. But if you focus on transition from better, you know, more advanced democratic regime to less advanced democratic regime in this setting, for example, from uh, liberal democracy to electoral democracy, we had several cases in, uh, uh, in the sample. And I found, interestingly, some uh, significant, significant relationship between increasing inequality and backward regime transition, and also 
the, the causal relationship between middle class size and uh, a backward regime change, meaning the squeezed middle uh, can cause backward regime transition. Thank you very much. Can I say something about the elites and the... <laughs> That's a very good, good uh, question because, I mean, at least in Western Europe, and anyway, from, from what I can see in, pop, in populist movements, I mean, there's also this dynamic that they're not so much about elites by themselves. They're against oligarchy. And if you read um, pro-populist intellectuals, like you know, Alain de Benoit and others, um, there is this idea, and that um, I mean that elites are necessary. Necessary. Um, they must enlighten and guide the people, but they must be connected with what they perceive to be the primal and root and and rooted forces of the nation and the people. So. So I think it's, there's a little bit of an ambiguity there. And this, by the way, it's, it's been said, for example, by Santiago Abascal, the leader of Vox in Spain, you know, saying, we're not against elites. We are against oligarchies. Um, let's collect a second round of questions. Or Petra, you had a comment, I think. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to, if I can, I think I speak loud enough. I just wanted to confirm that, and I think that is the, misunderstanding of uh, a deep misunderstanding about populism that it's about uh, against elite as such they divide not just between the people and the elite but between the pure people and the corrupt elite and what they don't <coughs> like is the corrupt current elite and they want to very often replace it by themselves so i think that is uh, east west uh, south uh, latin america everywhere so it's a uh, targeted anti-establishment as a feature of populism, but the necessary morality uh, dilemma added there. Sorry. Let's collect questions. Okay. Hi, I'm Laura Field um, with American University. And I think my question is for Josh and the three of you. Um, and it just, I, I think I'm just hoping you could kind of say a little bit more about a paradox or a which connects to this idea of elitism and going back to Nietzsche's idea of ressentiment, where I think the people Josh is talking about would see themselves as embodying a transvaluation of values that operates against um, the kind of, well, slave morality, right, which is what he talks about in the morality of the weak, and so an anti-resentiment um, morality is how they would understand themselves as sort of proto nietzscheans who represent vitalism and strength in the more authentic some version of master morality and you can you can do different things i think but i think your insight is that there's something extremely resentful and weak and impotent about their efforts to do so and about just their overall standing in in these in our modern democracy so i'm just wondering if you two if you both groups could talk a little bit more about that tension and that paradox. Hi, Keith Krishankin for University of Berlin. Uh, the question is for Josh and Jose Pedro. I was wondering how does your research interact? Because I can imagine that there's some overlap between this, um, these communities of masculinity and this great reset opponents um, if you could both comment on the intersection of your research. Thank you. Are there more questions at the back? Uh, hi there. It's uh, James Ball, I'm a journalist. Um, I'm not really affiliated with anyone, but uh, I've, I've got a question for Jose, which uh, is probably a bit facile, but uh, at the risk of doing a, you know, what if Archduke Franz Ferdinand's carriage took a different route? To what extent do you think Klaus Schwab's incredibly ill-advised book title fed into the Great Reset actually becoming a galvanizing movement? And one more question here. Thank you. Um, I'm Aaron Erie, and I also work here at the um, a Liberalism Studies program. I had two questions. The first is for Song, even though we can kind of talk about this later, but um, it's about kind of the role of historical memory or of historical transitions. 
um, in your ongoing research because I think if you're looking at people's sort of stated preferences, I think that saying that you're you're more inclined towards an authoritarian leader, I think if you have a historical experience of living under sort of an authoritarian uh, regime, I think that I think it can do two things. On the on the one hand, I think if you haven't done that right, like you can idealize that in a way that if you have a personal experience with authoritarianism, you may not um, quite as easily say that you have a stated preference for that. On the other hand, you may actually have a positive memory or a sort of nostalgic, uh, even if it's fake or only perceived memory of what life was like then, and you might say it. So my question is about how these differences manifest themselves. You use, obviously, the typology of uh, electoral democracy versus liberal, but I think that there's something about kind of the actual transitions. I'm not sure if there's something wrong with the mic or if it's me, but um, it's good, okay. Uh, my second question is, is for Josh and also Jose Pedro, which is about kind of the role of anonymity. Um, I, I've always found this sort of paradoxical about this sort of masculine strength and virility and all of these sorts of things, but then that to me at just an intuitive level seems to be in contrast with anonymity, with hiding, with shirking away. And the reason I included Jose Pedro in that is, is it purely a, you know, they will come after me, this sort of globalist elite will use their sort of technical tools to find me and all this sort of things. But there does seem to be something unsatisfying about that, about saying you're kind of an ubermensch and then hiding behind a sort of fake avatar and not really operating in the real world and sort of all of these things. I mean, these just seem paradoxical to me. So any, um, anything that you can say about that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. And I will give the floor to the speakers. No, I was thinking about uh, how you call towards um, maybe interlinkages between uh, andromasculinity and what we have been talking about. And it actually is a very productive question. Thank you so much because it also enabled me to answer a question that I had to judge myself about why should we matter? Why, 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 should, we, why should I care about these andromasculine uh, individuals who, you know, maybe there are, I don't know, five, six around the world in different you know, parts of the world, and then why should we follow them? Why should I care, right? And uh, I think the potential answer to that question, but I'll allow Josh uh, to, to talk about that, but um, what, what, what I see in this is a very interesting, um, again, interaction and interplay between individual and social, individual and collective. Because if we take these andromasculine types as individuals who are, you know, living in the context of, and correct me if I'm wrong, if they do live in the cultural context where white male privilege is very much uh, publicly, you know, uh, part of, uh, you know, the cultural evolution, let's say, when there is a lot of talk about white male privilege, and uh, in response to that potential cultural sort of putting them into shame and guilt about it, they revalue, transvalue, and reappraise, and they make it into a superior value, that white maleness, right? It's about race, and it's about the masculinity, and for them, it's, so it's an individual level psychic reaction to cultural pressures that bring them to the point of uh, identity, uh, transformation and is an answer to cultural pressures. Now, why should we, you know, here there is a response to, to, to the collective but at the individual level. Now, this becomes potentially important when, when politicians, political entrepreneurs, group leaders take on these, maybe not necessarily those specific stylistic points, but when we talk about Putin and his hypermasculinity, right, and um, you know, and 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 uh, I don't know, Orban or Erdogan, right, they they bring it, they, they you know, they they regulate uh, strategic narratives, they they control the media, right, and all of a sudden, from that individual phenomena, it becomes into a big political uh, political phenomena. So I look at this as very different, um, uh, you know, interplays in different cases where in one case there is an individual response and transvaluation to the potential societal pressures at specific social and cultural contexts, but there are other cases where at the political level, people in control in state offices use similar uh, 
mechanisms, but at a collective level and with not quite such stylistic responses, but psychologically working through similar pathways. Thank you. <coughs> Well, there were like many questions. The one about Klaus Schwab, wow, that's a good one. Um, I mean, the short answer, I mean, is yes. <laughs> I mean, listen, um, like every time, for example, I hear American presidents talk about, oh, we need to create a new world order. I'm like, oh, God. here it comes. <laughs> Bush Sr. did it, Obama did it, Biden, Biden did it. It's like, you know, it's like they should know better. They should know better. That immediately creates a huge backlash. And about Klaus Schwab, I mean, there is this um, aura of entitlement about the World Economic Forum and people like Klaus Schwab. Absolutely. The sense of entitlement that money, power, connections give you. And, and you know, then he feels entitled to write books like, you know, how to create a new world, etc. I mean, and it's like, and it's, it's like, and they all meet every year in Davos, in Switzerland, you know, the same group of people, and to say, you know, to, to implement or to think about new policies, new global policies, etc. All of this fits into it. That's why, for example, is there is the idea that this is not a, no longer a democracy, it's a post-democracy. Uh, Renaud Camus, who is the, you know, the guy behind the, the great replacement expression, he said that we don't live in a democracy, we live in Davos democracy. Davocracy. Davocracy. So absolutely, you are, you, are, you, are, you are right about that. Against um, the interaction between my work and the great anti greater set in just, yes, absolutely. I mean, one of the major memes in the internet is very important in terms of uh, recruitment and mobilization in this anti greater set camp. One of the memes is they want you fat and depressed so that they can control you. So it connects exactly with this idea of masculinity, of being in good health, of being fit, also as a way, as an individual, to fight back against this perceived assault on, on, people's, on people's health and, and, and lifestyle. So yeah, it's all about control, domination, freedom from domination. That's the paradigm. And then there was something else about um, What was the question about the Great Reset? That's for me, right? Yeah, it, it was about kind of anonymity and sort of the interaction. Yeah, yeah. I mean, anonymity is 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 dominant in this anti-Great Reset. However, Alex Jones has written a book about the Great Reset. Um, Dugin has written a book about Great Reset. A myriad others, you know, um, important figures have talked about Great Reset. The current conservative uh, um, leader in Canada has talked about the Great Reset. Many right-wing populist leaders in Europe have talked about the Great Reset. So yes, there is this army of, you know, anonyms of anonymous people on the internet, but there's definitely this more mainstreaming of this anti-Great uh, Reset uh, narrative. So it's a combination of the two, I would say. But being a Platonist, I'll work my way back through the questions, green composition-wise. So on this anonymity point, they really struggle with this from historically conditioned conceptions of masculinity they have, the anons, that those historical conceptions of masculinity in the West are, you stand up for yourself, you visibly put yourself out there, you function in a hierarchy where everyone has a name and a rank, where they're operating instead in these anonymous, decentralized <clears throat> networks, where they're giving up their names, they're giving up rank, they're giving up any kind of great man posturing. They really struggle with that. You see that a lot in their internal discourse. They'll accuse the people of just being anons as, you know, mere LARPing, live action role playing while in their pajamas in the basement. And there's some truth to that, and they're aware of the truth of it, and so they agree with each other all the time about that. Again, I think because of traditional conceptions of masculinity, no one should perform politically. And then working back through the intersection with Pedro's work really quickly, I didn't really pay attention to this until preparing for this conference and, and bringing the P work back in. When I read or watched actually a Pagan Futures conference that Thomas Roussel, that neo-pagan in uh, England did, this was a conference last year, and he spends the whole talk at this Pagan Futures conference discussing the Great Reset and transhumanism. 
So they are a branch of populism. And they're linking into much deeper far-right currents, I would say, but they're tapping into populist language and concerns pretty overtly in their public presentations, at least. On the question of resentment, and the, uh, as one uh, commentator on resentment called it, the slow poisoning of one's own soul, the slow poisoning of one's own soul and resentment, as these Nietzscheans, as they style themselves, these vitalists, uh, they're very aware of this danger to resentment. So I totally agree with the point that they're doing a reverse transvaluation of values. They think the slave morality has conquered. They're now responding to that cultural development, critique of settler colonialism, whiteness, maleness, straightness. They're responding to that critique and then developing an ideological response to the critique. That's where I double down on this claim that we would see political masculinism, masculinities rather, political masculinities, you see at all points in time. But masculinism, an ism with an ideology attached, takes self-awareness about cultural context. It only emerges in reaction to a cultural context. And this links back to the self-help point, which I didn't get to earlier. Only a kind of increasing overtness around talking about masculinity, which only emerged in the 70s and onward with the kind of uh, new man movements, self-help movements around masculinity, only with that increasing awareness about one's own emotion and positionality and body could I think this current iteration of masculinism emerge. There has to be an openness to those affects, to the body, that was not present in a lot of Western masculinities before that self-help movement in the 70s around uh, masculinities, which itself was drawing from other gender movements, um, feminism and the like. And then the very last point was um, just doubling down on this uh, responsiveness of masculinism as an ideology to what's going on uh, more broadly. Hopefully I hit all the points. Ah, sorry, so on one more real quick. So on the resentment point, they want to escape the danger of being resentful about this slave revolt. So when I write about them in the context of conspiracism, you know, that's very important for these types. Only conspiracies on the part of the slave morality holding types could have resulted in the overthrowing of such a self-evidently amazing group of people or men. Only a conspiracy by the weak, this is as old as Nietzsche's first um, treatise in genealogy and morality, only a conspiracy could bring down the downfall of these self-evidently great people, or a decadence that's built into the nature of things that just happens over millennia, an increasing decadence. They also attribute decline to that, to Christianity, or to, in the broader capital T traditionalist vision of the world from people like Julius Ebla on the far right, they attribute decline to a multi-millennial process of increasing decadence. So both of those moves, conspiracism and traditionalism, allows them to escape resentment. They move shifts onto those two spheres. Yeah. Yeah, I think in response uh, to this uh, idea that uh, these uh, andro uh, heroes would have somehow escaped resentment uh, by being aware of it. Um, it seems that, I mean, there isn't exactly this kind of example of uh, uh, aggrieved entitlement of this sociologist Michael Kimmel has uh, written about. So there is the sense of these kind of privileges that are going away and by kind of extremely uh, transvaluating the situation where these uh, requirements of equality, kind of gender neutrality, political correctness are kind of posed to them, kind of extrapolating the kind of old ideals of masculinity to a new potency these forms of kind of raw age, uh, <laughs> return to paganism and, and, and these kind of ideals. It seems that they are not just defending the existing white privileges, but they are claiming something more beyond it. Yeah. And that kind of is a sign of kind of transvaluation. Yeah, I can quickly answer Aaron's point. Um, so it previously said um, people negatively evaluating the pre their, their experience about um, the communist regime are more likely to support democracy and more likely to kind of, you know, to, to, to oppose the authoritarian leader. And I didn't test it, but it's kind of conventional knowledge. But the more interesting thing, I think, is kind of testing if um, people are from uh, people in the former communist country are more likely to support democracy or less likely to, to support democracy. So being 
uh, upon observing uh, in increasing income inequality, I think that is kind of interesting question, and I wouldn't be surprised to see, to, to see uh, people negatively evaluating their experiences in former, you know, Soviet Union or something, uh, are more kind of immune to um, increasing income inequality, and so they might be fine with increasing uh, income inequality or bad economic performances of democratic government, uh, I think. But well, it's definitely worth testing. Thanks. Please join me for the round of applause to our speakers and to the audience.